Hey everyone, it's Mrs. Wallace. I hope all is well with you. I think I had told you that I uh, was not gonna be in school today because I'm picking up my daughter from college. Uh, so I just wanted to drop this quick video so you could get an introduction to our next unit. We are going to be looking at market failures. We've looked at a few already. Um, any market failure is where we don't have allocative efficiency. That means that there's deadweight loss. So for example, you know, per unit taxes on a producer, definitely something that we would consider a market failure. So we've looked at a few of these, but um, we're going to be looking at um, types of goods that often don't get produced well in the market. You know, the market, the, the supply and demand model um, doesn't always uh, create the right quantity of goods. Uh, there are certain goods that kind of defy um, production in the market, um, and that's what we want to look at, either public goods or externalities. If you remember, uh, Charlie Whelan talked about externalities a lot in his um, book, uh, Naked Economics. The, the um, basic idea of an externality is going to be um, when we have production of a good that either imposes some type of social cost on uh, third parties or when there is um, uh, perhaps it could be a positive externality when we essentially want more of the good uh, and we have a mismatch in what um, the uh, demand curve, um, you know, what we think the demand curve is and what it really is based on um, uh, social benefit. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about externalities uh, in class tomorrow, but I wanted to at least introduce uh, public goods and um, get us into that uh, a little bit. Uh, so a few things about market failures. Uh, market failures, again, are when uh, a supply and demand model, you know, is ceasing to be allocatively efficient. Uh, if we have over or under production, you know, resources that produce that good are either over allocated and some of those resources could be used for something else or they're under allocated. Society is not getting the allocatively efficient quantity where marginal cost equals marginal benefit and the good is being under allocated. And you know, in both of those cases, whether it's over allocation or under allocation, we'd have deadweight loss. And uh, we know uh, from working with past models uh, that that's something that happens and can also be uh, a problem. And keep in mind the whole intent of this market model in economics is uh, designed to be efficient. It's all about using resources efficiently to create the quantity of a good uh, that's the right quantity for society, you know, using marginal uh, costs and marginal benefits. Um, you know, we also have made a lot of assumptions about the supply and demand curves that we have been drawing, assuming that they um, are correct, that the data that would be um, described at each point on a demand or supply curve would actually be accurate. And in the case of externalities, um, we know that the demand curves sometimes don't reflect uh, the consumer's full willingness to pay, and the supply curves might not actually reflect all of the true costs of production. So externalities are going to get us into asking what really are the true costs of production, for example, for a good where there might be some sort of, you know, elimination of carbon, you know, into the air and um, the social costs of producing a good might not be included in the marginal cost in the way we're graphing something. And uh, economists are going to be quick to remind us, you know, social costs uh, matter as well. Uh, so that's where we'll get into externalities. Uh, just to remind you, when we're talking about efficiency and inefficiency and allocative efficiency, in this uh, market model, we have full uh, total welfare or maximized consumer and producer surplus. Remember, consumer and producer surplus never have to equal each other. That's not uh, something that's you know ever uh, true necessarily. It could be true, but not necessarily the case. Uh, but what we have here is zero deadweight loss and a market that's producing the allocatively efficient quantity where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And uh, Q1 is the um, quantity. And this is, happens to be a, a, a graph for uh, bags. Uh, if we have a situation where we have um, under production, uh, quantity Q2 is produced rather than quantity Q1. As a result of quantity Q2 uh, being produced, you know, we have all kinds of problems, but um, we do get dead weight loss. The dead weight loss is showcasing um, that yeah, inefficiency. It's lost consumer and producer surplus, uh, lost total welfare, and we're underproducing the good. Society wants quantity Q1, and uh, they're only getting quantity uh, Q2. We also can have um, dead weight loss from overproduction, and this is good just to kind of uh, remind yourself if the allocatively efficient quantity is quantity Q1, 
and the society is now producing quantity Q3, that's over allocation resources. You know, we're making too many bags and some of the resources that are making bags ideally could go to the production of something else. And uh, that's where opportunity costs come in. Um, and, you know, whenever you have dead weight loss, you know, we have a market failure. So, you know, what we're looking at in terms of examples of market failures are not that unique. Uh, but um, public goods, the topic of today's video, um, they really are uh, very, very interesting because uh, in the case of public goods, we're going to suggest that it's the characteristic of the goods themselves that create the market failure. And most of the goods that we've looked at in class so far have been examples of private goods. OK, so there is a distinction in economics between private goods and public goods. Uh, so make note of that somewhere uh, in your you know, notebook or whichever the um, idea behind private goods. You know, these are the things that, you know, you're out there maybe shopping for the holidays, buying some things. Uh, the uh, typical everyday goods that we're buying in the market are often private goods. They have two characteristics by definition. Okay, so this is essentially what a private good is. It's a rivalrous and it is excludable. Uh, what we mean by rivalry is that, um, you know, a pair of jeans for sale, for example, at Abercrombie, if I am um, desiring and paying for a pair of jeans, uh, the good is rivalrous because my buying of the jeans means nobody else can have them. I bought them. Nobody else is also using them, owning them, sharing them, anything like that, unless, you know, I take that on. But for the most part, it's a rivalrous good. It's also excludable. The jeans are in such packages that um, they can be, you know, set on a table and uh, sold in individual units so that a price can be set for the pair of jeans and they are easily available for consumers to, you know, pick up and pay for, you know, a pair of jeans. And most goods, we take it for granted that that's how these goods are designed, both rivalrous and excludable. Uh, firms can't easily sell goods. <laughs> Um, without having these characteristics be true, okay? Uh, goods that don't meet these characteristics um, make it much more difficult for uh, firms to sell these goods, and oftentimes we might see market failures. Uh, an example would be public goods, and public goods do um, note two important things about public goods in your notes, and this is a place where some of this information is not intuitive like other information in economics, so you kind of have to take notes in this section. There's a very specific definition of public goods, and um, it, it is not something that's provided by the government. Our use of the word public sector sometimes confuses students because we think, well, everything that is produced by the government must therefore then be a public good. So like education or the post office or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's not the case. Sometimes public goods are produced by the market uh, through some very creative means. Sometimes um, uh, the government actually uh, produces uh, goods that are excludable and rivalrous. So it's not a given uh, that economically defined public goods are produced by the government. Oftentimes that is the case because if the market is going to fail in the production of a good, you know, then uh, if it's an important good, <laughs> the government's going to end up uh, producing it on the taxpayer's dime. But let's look at the characteristics. This is the second part of public goods. It's really important. You know, what's the definition? Uh, so first of all, um, public goods by definition are non-rivalrous. Okay, this means if I I'm using the good, somebody else could be using the good at the same time. Every night I pull into my driveway and I drive down a street that has lights, okay, it has street lights. My use of um, the street lights is not impairing anyone else on my street, you know, from using the street lights. The same thing with a stop sign. I'm using the stop sign, somebody else can also use the stop sign. In fact, all signage, right, that I pass on my way home on Route 4 is something that's non-rivalrous. I'm using it, I'm seeing it, I'm looking at it. Everybody else who's driving home is doing the same thing. Other examples of non-rivalrous public goods, concerts in a park that many people are watching, uh, a lighthouse, you might have multiple ships taking advantage of a lighthouse, um, national defense, right? So um, national defense is something that um, I might be uh, benefiting from, uh, but you may also be benefiting from that. And people in like Iowa might also be benefiting from that, okay? It's non-rivalrous. Uh, the other thing is um, public goods are non-excludable. Can't really easily package them into units uh, for uh, people to 
you know, kind of pick them up and take them with them or easily uh, pay for them. Um, it creates, uh, even if you could exclude them, some people will get the good regardless of ever paying for it. So um, this creates a free rider problem. You know, what do we mean by this? We'll say that there is national defense and uh, Mark decides that he's going to open a firm to actually provide national defense. You know, forget the government for a second. Let's imagine that Mark is going to provide the entire country with national defense. And maybe he figures this is a good way to make some money, pay for college. And he's going to uh, create this firm and collect um, fees from all these people who are going to pay Mark, you know, for national defense. The national uh, defense, you know, everybody pays. Um, but of course, some people might say, you know, why should I pay? You know, my neighbor's paying. <laughs> why should I pay? I'm still going to get national defense. It becomes very difficult if Mark is going to offer the product of national defense to actually give national defense to some people, the people who pay, and some people, the people who don't. Um, if we can't really exclude the people who don't pay, uh, it's a public good. <laughs> you know, it's at least partially a public good if it's not excludable. Um, it makes it a really funky thing. Uh, the same thing with, you know, fireworks, right? Um, I have often uh, set on a school <laughs> uh, building far from the actual fireworks in uh, Ridgewood. Um, so I didn't have to pay, you know, in order to get into the main fireworks, right? That is, you know, a pure free rider, somebody who's benefiting from a, a fireworks show, uh, but seeing it from afar and not paying, you know, the entrance fee in order to go, okay? So it's not excludable. If you can have a fireworks show and some people are just going to see it because they're driving by in their cars, uh, there's nothing you can do. It's not excludable. Um, because of these features, non-rivalrous and non-excludable, it is very um, unlikely likely that Mark is going to end up paying, uh, you know, having a firm rather uh, that provides national defense because if half of the country decides they're not going to pay, uh, he's going to have a very weak firm. He's only going to be collecting fees uh, from a few people. Uh, so it makes it uh, so that the market tends to fail uh, with pure public goods, goods that are non-rivalrous or non-excludable. Um, one last thing I'm just going to note, I just want to make sure I have enough time, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. You know, in the um, market of supply and demand, we assume that we can create an efficiency uh, quantity of goods that's allocatively efficient. We still talk about allocative efficiency uh, with public goods, um, despite the fact that we really don't have you know, a market providing these goods often. Sometimes we just use what's called cost benefit analysis uh, for, say, uh, example, you know, the number of street lights on my street. Um, maybe there's six of them, maybe there's 10 of them. If we were looking at what would be the right quantity, you know, of streetlights on Mrs. Wallace's street, you know, all the people who live on that street derive a certain benefit from the, every next streetlight. You know, maybe uh, a new streetlight in an area that's pretty dark uh, grants a significant amount of benefit. So benefit might be, um, you know, greater than cost. And so, yes, we provide that streetlight. Uh, maybe as we're looking at in additional streetlights at a certain point, uh, the cost of the streetlight might be greater than the benefit of the additional you know, street light. So we use cost benefit analysis to understand the quantity of uh, public goods that we should have, you know, how many lighthouses, how many um, you know, street lights, how many stop signs. Uh, a lot of that is related to uh, things that we've looked at, you know, marginal benefit, marginal cost, in this case of the next uh, resource, uh, the next public good, okay? I'm going to stop there. So in class tomorrow, we can spend a little bit more time with specific categories of public goods. Uh, there are a few that are really significant, and this gets us into a lot of issues related uh, to the environment, okay? But just for now, note that definition of public goods, okay? I will uh, see you in class tomorrow.